you could be on stage and want to have a bass drop. And the drummer's got a little pad behind him and he assigns his favorite bass drop to this one pad. He smacks it with a stick and the bass drop plays on stage. Kind of thing. So you can really customize and make little special effects or whatever you want. Oh, yeah. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast. The show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tain, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? I'm great, man. How are you? Uh, it's I've been better. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel bad for asking after the conversation we just had. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, um, I'm pretty tired, but I'm gonna get uh, through this. And yeah, I'm feeling feeling good actually. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, this. Uh, I guess when this comes out, the course will have already have gone through its launch. Um, yeah, but Benny is in the the belly of the beast right now making that happen for all of you <laughs> exactly exactly and uh yeah seems like i don't know how to say that <laughs> i'm cursed there's trials that's right yeah let's call it that way no but it's working i'm working super hard and we're gonna get this out or it should be out at this point um yeah and then yeah all right um I, uh, this is just me bragging but i got uh into the mix poll in the urm uh mix off in the most recent month, which is like a, for people unaware, I'm sure most people are aware because we talk about that community quite a bit, but um, it's like a mixing community educational platform and they have like a mix off every month. And I got into the top 20 for the first time, which is really cool. Congrats, man. Like I saw that post. I was so happy for you. That's awesome. Which band was it? Which session was it? Uh, Sleeping with Sirens, which oh. I have no idea if that's the band or the song. Honestly, <laughs> it's the band. It's, it's the dude. It's the band. <laughs> I'm not familiar with them, but uh, the song was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. So <laughs> I had a blast mixing it. But <laughs> honestly, yeah, I'd never listened to them before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, congrats, dude. Uh, it has the mix poll already happened. I didn't win it, but that's oh, okay. Okay, okay uh, that's okay. top twenty in a community full of amazing mixers is pretty sweet. I'll take that. Yeah, and also the like the standard is not what it was with those like in the beginning. I remember when I joined a couple of years ago, um, those top twenty mixes. Sometimes some of them weren't that great, but now we have so many. Like they have so many super talented people in there that yeah. you compete with like super pros basically. And like yeah, yeah. totally. And, it's uh, it's definitely stiff competition. Um, yeah, some of our really close friends compete every month and it's like oh man they're good <laughs> yeah super uh, stoked and, and like, uh, another and like, cool thing about it yeah. is that i used because uh, i've been making a drum sample library with some some other um colleagues and i used the samples we've been making oh, almost wow. exclusively on that so it's like it's like kind of a proof is in the pudding that the, the samples are great <laughs> oh that that's even better awesome that's cool uh, will right. this be a will the drum sample thing will this be uh um, like a release, a publicly available it will thing, to, or? In, in some degree, yeah. We, okay. we actually have plans to to try and license it to a platform, um, and I won't really go further than that on on air here for now. Yeah. Um, but uh, in whatever happens, it's coming out in one shape or another, and I'll obviously keep everybody updated because it's pretty massive. It's wicked. Oh, that's a, that's super cool. That's super cool to hear. I was not sure if it's just a thing for yourself, like, or if it's going to be a public product. Public it'll product. it'll be a a public product because there's like there's going to be at least four engineers contributing at this point, um, and they're all heavy hitters. It's it's like a, the stuff is sweet. I'm so stoked on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. We haven't talked about this really, but yeah, cool, 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 good, good. Yeah stoked all right. So yeah, that, that's there's a little bit of a, a tie in to what we're talking about exactly. Here. Um, because drum samples don't just magically make themselves onto tracks. They have to be placed there through some kind of software. Um, and essentially what we're talking about today is programming and MIDI basics. Um, and how and why you would use it and how it works to some extent. This is going to be like a really basic overview and probably a little bit even incorrect. But as long as it helps you understand. <laughs> yeah. Because I really don't understand like the the... Like, I don't have the most te technical understanding of how it works, but I can make it do what I want. And that's really what I'm most concerned about getting our listeners up to speed with is not being afraid to open up a MIDI keyboard and try and make their idea come to life. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's the thing with MIDI. It's also for me, it's one of those things that just has to work, but I don't really care if I really understand what's going on. And like, it's it's not so complicated. So you, the basics are pretty easy to understand and to explain, I think. But it goes much deeper than like the surface level stuff that we use every day. But um, I don't really care. I, I once read, actually, I once read the, I think it's called the Practical MIDI Handbook or something like that. It's the the original the OG MIDI oh. handbook from the 80s. <laughs> that must have been the most boring thing. I, I once I once read that because I just wanted to know. I was just, I don't know, it, it was just interested. It was years ago and I was just like, what the? Like this is, yeah, exactly. So bo boring on the one hand, but also sort of fascinating. I don't know why. <laughs> and it's, what's fascinating to me is that this almost 40-year-old, or I think it is 40-year-old at this point, um, technology still hasn't changed basically it's the same thing it's the same thing they used in the early 80s and it's still the standard yeah. for doing these things so um it's definitely something you should understand how to use not so much why and how it works under the hood but just know how to use it correctly and what to use it for and how to set it up and that's what we're going to talk in this episode we're going to talk about in this episode it's not a specific drum sample episode we've done those um but mm -hmm. it's a, a midi one 101 like uh MIDI basics. Yeah, basic overview. Um, yeah, and it is always amazing to me when I do find folks who have never tried to use it at all because it is easily the most powerful tool that uh, a band has available to them with yeah. modern DAWs. Um, it, like, it changes everything. You just need a laptop and you can make a song without even recording a single instrument now yeah. um, to some extent, right? Yeah. So it's, it's truly a lifesaver if you don't have access to recording gear. Okay, so I'll I think I'll start with um, the the real basics, but I come across these a couple of times every every month probably. Like it's still a, a regularly occurring thing that people confuse MIDI and audio files, for example. So before we dive into how it actually works, I want to say that MIDI a MIDI file does not contain audio information. It's not an an audio file that you can pl play yeah. back. You might think you it is because it. probably you've you've imported a MIDI file at some point and then your software automatically loaded up some instrument or sampler or whatever and then you hit play and you could hear something. But that's not because this information is in the MIDI file. The way a MIDI file works is it contains commands, like basic commands that tell a piece of software what to do. That's what a MIDI file is. So it doesn't have the actual audio in it. It's just a trigger for something else to fire off pre-recorded samples or do whatever you tell it to do. So just as you like you click on your mouse and your computer does something after you do that, it's the same thing. You click on a MIDI keyboard and the computer does something. And it's mm -hmm. it's not an audio file, a MIDI file. So I think the most often used and uh, Im most important things we need to talk about are the MIDI notes themselves, like yep. which note is, is being played and what causes that in the device that you're sending it to, then how loud is that note? Like, what's the velocity? So velocity is the term for, and, and that's one of the things that's probably not correct, but I, I just say it that way because it's easy to understand. You can think of velocity as like similar to a volume or intensity control, mm -hmm. like lower velocity means quieter uh, note, louder velocity means more louder note. So in case of drum samples, if you send a MIDI note to a sampler, with a low velocity, you're going to hear a quiet drum hit. If you send the same note with a higher velocity to the same sampler, you hear a louder drum hit. So yes. that's the velocity. Same as with pianos, you hit the keys harder or softer and uh, get a different velocity and it triggers a different sound, yeah. um, different volume. And then the third thing is besides the actual note and the velocity, the third thing are articulations or key switches is what they call it. This is... You play a note, and then in addition to that, you hit another key or you program another command, another note. That mm. doesn't cause the sampler or the software to play a sound, but it causes it to alter the sound that it's been play that it's playing. So right. this could be a sustain pedal on a piano, or yeah. telling an acoustic guitar instrument to do a palm mute or an open strum, or, right. or like everybody's things always like messed with like the pitch bender on a, on yeah. a synthesizer. Exactly, exactly. These are articulations that you can trigger. Um, these are key switches that allow you to not just have boring 
uh, like Nintendo sounds that you know, like because the bare, the bare basics would be which note, how loud, and with the right. articulations, the key switches, you can make it more natural. You can alter it, you can change it, and like there's basically almost unlimited possibilities depending on the sampler you're using. So that's the basic three things. Um, we should kind of start that like the the visualizing of a MIDI map on a a keyboard and just go get people imagine like trying to see something um, because a lot of people don't realize that using a MIDI keyboard is the same as punching in the the commands on a, on your DAW using your mouse you can do the same thing with your mouse as you can do with a MIDI keyboard um, or MIDI drum pads or whatever it's all the same um, but it's really easy to visualize if you visualize a piano roll um, so if you've got a piano in front of you or a piano roll in front of you on your screen even each one of those notes is going to correspond with a certain sample inside of the software that you pair it with. So if anybody's taken a piano lesson, they know there's something called middle C. And if you go up an, or down an octave, that's no longer middle C. That's, you know, C negative, C plus one or whatever, right? Um, and those aren't going to correspond to the same sound inside of the software. So if it's a piano, they're going to match up. It's like playing a piano, which is really convenient. But if it's a drum kit, you know, one of these keys is going to be the kick drum. And another is going to be the snare. But if you go up an octave and hit the same note, it's not the same snare sample there. It's going to be a different sound, maybe a different iteration of the snare, per perhaps, kind of thing. Um, it, it varies from software, so you kind of got to figure it out like that. But just knowing that each key on that piano roll is assigned to a certain number and letter, which is identified by the software. And that's how they communicate, is that, uh, that the name of that track or of that key is the MIDI data that's going to be sent to the sampler, essentially. <laughs> yes, true. And and you got to either learn what the MIDI map looks like in the sampler you're using. So mm -hmm. the MIDI map is basically just, yeah, a map that tells you which key triggers what. And you can either learn the way it's set up with whatever instrument or hardware device or whatever you're using, or you can change and customize the MIDI map and make it so that it works for you. So you can go into a drum sample and say, I want the C to be the kick and the D to be the snare. Yep. And then, you know, and like you can assign these things so that it's convenient for you to play. Or if you're using like MIDI pads or some sort of input device or an, an e-drum kit or whatever, you have to assign the pads to a certain sample so that it works because you don't want the snare to fire off if you hit the kick drum, you know? So, um, yeah, that's that's exactly that's what Malcolm said. That, that that's how it works, and it's the core components are a MIDI input device, so either a program MIDI track that you just where you just draw in the notes with a pencil in your software, or like a pre-recorded MIDI track that that you have, or a loop or something. You can purchase loops online, or you have something some in your DAW maybe. This is just the input device, either a, a loop, a file, or an actual device like pads, a keyboard, stuff like that, and then you have the device that you send that to. This can be a virtual instrument, a drum sampler, um, a virtual keyboard, anything like that, or it could be a hardware synth or sampler, or it could even be, and we can get to that later, but it could even be other things like other plugins that you can trigger with the MIDI notes. You can tell a gate mm -hmm. to open with a MIDI note, for example, sometimes, or stuff like yeah. that. So input device, and then something you sent that to, and then the output of what you send it to goes to an audio output in your DAW, basically, and then you hear what's coming out. That's uh, the signal flow, basically, if you will. That is the exact chain, yeah. Um, and in the interest of getting people able to experiment with that right away, if they haven't already, um, yeah, you can get like a little MIDI keyboard and it'll just plug in via a USB cable uh, and it'll probably just work right away. It's like <laughs> amazingly simple most of the time. Sometimes you have to like download some drivers or tell the DAW to communicate with it, but generally it's just like plug and play. Um, or like we've mentioned, there's always a, a MIDI editor um, piano roll inside of your DAW. So it'll just look like a piano and you can draw in literally what notes you want to get played. Um, there's even some newer functions like in Pro Tools recently, you can drag an audio track onto a MIDI file, uh, like onto a MIDI instrument track, and it will generate MIDI off of that audio file. Um, and now you've kind of got like a rough outline of what was being played in audio is now converted to MIDI. And now, so say it was a guitar solo drag that onto the instrument track and now I can throw on like a trombone <laughs> virtual instrument and it's going to play that same guitar solo but on a trombone now. So like it can really be a powerful little tool if, if used 
in creative ways. Yeah, how do we get, like you mentioned the USB to uh, to the computer. How do you mm -hmm. usually get the MIDI information into your DAW? How do you do that? So the, the easiest thing, as you said, like um, like you connect the, the interface to USB, or not the interface, the controller via USB, and it should work. But if it doesn't work, or if you don't have a USB keyboard, or like, how do you get MIDI into your DAW? Right, yeah. So, because I did skip a step that I assume people would know, but that's definitely not to be assumed, is that you can't, if you plug in a MIDI keyboard, it's not going to work on an audio channel. Um, because an audio channel is expecting audio. So the it's, it's just not going to receive anything. So you have to, uh, in Pro Tools, it's called an instrument track. Um, or there's there's also MIDI channels in Pro Tools, but an instrument channel is really what you want to use. Um, and you make that instead of an audio track, and it's going to be looking to receive MIDI information from something. Furthermore, another step that could trip people up is that if you just do that and start playing your MIDI keyboard, it might be receiving the data, but it's not going to play any sound because there's no, there's no virtual instrument for it to engage with. So the, that MIDI data is silent. Like Benny said, it's not an audio file. It's just MIDI information. It's ones and zeros at the end of the day. Um, and you have to pair it with some kind of software that's going to intelligently take that information and turn it into sound. So there's making a MIDI or instrument channel in your DAW and then pairing it with the software that it can play with. Um, those are like the two big steps. I think, Benny, you asked another question in there was if you don't have a MIDI keyboard, right? If you, do, if so, you don't have a USB MIDI keyboard, like if you have... Say you have, like for me, for example, I have a a big um, electric piano, like a stage piano, oh. a really big one in my studio that doesn't have a USB, but it has MIDI outputs. So, it has MIDI out, okay. Yeah. So this is fascinating because, uh, yeah, USB and MIDI are pretty much just used interchangeably now. People, like when they bring in a, a, a keyboard, um, they're like, oh, can we plug in MIDI? And they hand me a USB cable and I don't think twice about it, right? But technically, that's not really correct uh there's these old cables called midi cables which i think are like they have six pins i believe right and kind of like a semicircle going around maybe it's five I five remember. i think five five okay um and they yeah they they're they're midi cables and they're just used for sending that information and um old school like brains i guess is what i would call them midi brains which would ha like house different instruments inside of it would have ports to receive those midi cables and and take that information in and output sound. It was like before computers were doing it for us, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in all of my career, I've been doing this since 2009, more or less, I think, uh, I've never had to use a MIDI cable in my life. Really? Not once. That's fascinating. Yeah. Like, I do, it, I do it quite <laughs> a bit, actually. Like, I, first of all, most modern or many modern interfaces still have a MIDI input. Like the one that I'm talking to right now has a MIDI in and out, classic MIDI in and out. Mm -hmm. um, some don't, but some have a, a breakout cable or something like that where you can plug the MIDI in. But as I said, with like this big piano that I have, that's the only way to do it. And then also there are, I mean, that's sort of rare, but some people like to use that stuff. There are like classic hardware synths, like synthesizers, devices from the 80s or 90s or whatever, um, where you actually use them the other way around. You You generate a MIDI file or you play a MIDI file on a MIDI keyboard uh, and and you have that MIDI file in the DAW, and then you send it out to exactly. through the MIDI out into That's the right. hardware device, and then that puts out an audio signal, and you record that back in. So that's also a way that it can be used. So I, I actually use it quite a bit, not as often anymore, but it still happens. So just to is it for you? Is it mainly to make use of that piano as um, a MIDI controller? Yeah, that's my that's my only um, use for it basically. But I yeah. work with people who like these old synths sometimes or right um or they just yeah, i could see that yeah like or, if you yeah. if you have something that's got the sound you're looking for it's just it's just another way of interfacing to it right so if yeah. if it can't take usb and it can take midi cables you got to figure that out um yeah. like you said some daws or sorry some interfaces will have midi ports so in that case it you just link them up it'll be should be pretty straightforward Sometimes they don't, and you have to get like an additional dongle to do it, like a breakout cable from um, your interface, or even there's like some USB to MIDI uh, dongles as well out there that I've seen. Again, I've never had to use one, so can't really help you there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and I think there are also some classic like drum machines or drum modules that only work with MIDI and not USB. So right. but there, there might be some use cases. I just wanted to mention it in case you're wondering, like maybe you have a keyboard or whatever, but it doesn't have USB like an old whatever it is, and you're wondering how to how to do it. So 
Yeah, right. the MIDI cable is the way yeah. to do. I, I've had people, like with a Nord, for example, think that they had to use the old school MIDI thing. Oh, and it's okay. like, oh, I'm going to blow your mind. You just use this USB plug and we're good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's such a simple thing. I mean, it's a technology that's 40 years old and you just like, yeah, easy to do, transfer these uh, commands via a USB cable, like the yeah. MIDI over USB thing. It's just plug and play, super easy to do. So, Definitely. yeah, cool. So that's that's how it works. That's how you get it into the computer. And typical input devices would be small MIDI keyboard that sits on your desktop, for example. Mm-hmm. I have something like that to do post-pro or program baselines, simple things like that. Um, could be a big like electric piano. Could be your mouse. Draw the stuff yep. in. Could be the keyboard of your computer. You can set that up as a trigger. So you can like play the drums on your keyboard, like the, the, key, the computer keyboard. You yep. can have like drum pads. You can have, um, yeah, there are various input devices. And that's basically all there is to say about the workflow or like the, 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 the signal flow. Yeah, I think maybe just to add, again, stressing that it's not an audio file. It is just MIDI information that is getting into your computer in like the, the typical workspace of or workflow of, that we're describing where you're taking MIDI information into your computer and then pairing it with a plugin to make sound. Um, rather than the sending out to old synthesizers and stuff. The the more common workflow of taking MIDI information into your computer, it's not an audio file. And why why is that important and useful to us? The reason that's important and useful to us is that we can modify it for as long as we want. Um, and so I think we've talked about this with drums especially. You know, if you program drums at the start of the project and you're tracking to it and you decide you want to change the groove because the guitarist has come up with like a new rendition of a certain riff, you can still go do that. You don't have to go and set up drums and re-record from scratch. You can just literally modify the performance um, right up until mixing. Uh, until you commit those audio files, they're totally interchangeable, which is super powerful. Um, you can also edit the performance with like unlimited power. Um, there's, there's nothing you can't do in editing. Um, if, so some, sometimes people might play it on a piano, but then you can go and tighten it up in the DAW if you need to. That's, I think, is the classic scenario that we need to talk about um, and that I, I, I come across this so often. When people play the keys, when they play a piano and they want to record it and they ask me how to record it, what they think about is always, how do I get the audio from the keyboard into the computer? And they don't even think about that recording the audio is almost always a bad idea or completely unnecessary because... Unless you have a Nord or something that really sounds super nice, where the sounds are actually really good and better than the plugins or the virtual instruments, there's no need to record the audio at all because it's like plugins and virtual instruments are just so much better and you can't really edit the audio. So yeah. what you want to do is you won't, you don't need to find a way to get the quarter-inch check or whatever into the interface. What you need to do is you need to connect the USB record the MIDI commands and load up a virtual instrument. And what you're going to hear is not your keyboard, but you're going to hear your computer play um, play back what's coming out of a sampler. That's the way to do it. And in 99% of all cases, that's what you should do. So if people are wondering what to do with their keyboard, that's what you should do. Connect the USB, just use it as an input device and ignore the sounds in the keyboard. Just turn the volume off or whatever yeah. and trigger an instrument in your computer because that's most of the time sounding gonna sound better and also as Malcolm said you can play one take and that's it and then you go in and tidy it and clean it up and like quantize it or do whatever you want um, but there's no need to get the the absolute perfect performance of course feeling and everything is always important but it's not like you can do anything you want with it you can completely change it you can make a new song out of it you can erase it you can like it's just commands that you can move around quantize and so no need to record the audio from a keyboard. That's the classic scenario, I think, that we absolutely need to talk about. Because I don't know why, but I, I, there's this misconception that I come across all the time that people don't realize that it's just an input device. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so incredibly powerful workflow tool. It It's quick. Um, the This is totally just a tangent, but the debate between like the sound of the built-in piano sounds versus the virtual plug-in piano sounds is so hilarious to me because it's the same thing it's just a computer inside of the keyboard or a computer inside of a computer doing the, the work it's like <laughs> i don't know i don't understand that argument it, that's not the same as tube amps versus amp sims <laughs> it's, it's just like uh you realize that it's just like 
it's it's not an acoustic piano you're playing, but yeah, <laughs> have you ever come across that? Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. absolutely have, and it's only true in the like if you really like the the Hammond sound in a Nord, for example, that's a classic thing that just sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or but they could just release a plug-in version of it one day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, as you said, it's just uh, a, a pretty crappy computer playing back the samples instead of your good computer that could do that. So yeah, totally. Anyway. Um, so uh, I think to make this a little more abstract, actually, yeah, um, we've been talking about how instruments relate to a MIDI map, um, but I wanted to also tell people that if they want, they can assign their own sounds to any key on a MIDI map as well. Um, so there's there's different tools that allow you to do that. Um, so you you've probably at some point seen a DJ or something with like a big pad, uh, like almost like a drum pad. There's normally like you know like four spots or like eight spots with different pads, and they hit it and something happens. They hit another one, something happens, um, and that's yeah, that's a cool power with this is you could be on stage and want to have a bass drop, and the drummer's got a little pad behind him and he assigns his favorite bass drop to this one pad. He smacks it with a stick and a bass drop plays on stage kind of thing. So you can really customize and make little special effects or whatever you want. Um, it doesn't have to be tied to a specific instrument necessarily. Oh, yeah. Or even logical. You know, one could be a piano no, chord and the other could be a drum, like on the same keyboard with the right software. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to another important thing that we skipped sort of, and that is we need to probably explain what a sampler is, like the concept mm -hmm. of a sampler, what that actually is, because that's another misconception. When people think of drum samples or piano samples or any sort of samples, they sometimes think it's a synthesizer that's creating an artificial fake sound that mm -hmm. sounds sort of like a drum or like a piano. That's not what, right. what a sampler is. A sampler is a device, a playback device, a very simple player that just plays an audio sample. And an audio sample is a small, usually a pretty short, small snippet of a real audio recording. So you hit a snare drum, you record that hit, you cut the, you cut it very short in the beginning, like you cut all the silence off in the beginning, and you make the tail as long as you want it. And that single drum hit is a sample. And you load that into a sampler, which is like a basic audio player. And when the sampler receives the MIDI note that tells it to play that sample, it just hits play and you hear that snare sample. So it's a real snare drum recorded in a real room by real people mm -hmm. that's been playing played back by a sampler. Same with a piano. If if you play a virtual piano, it's the people who make these libraries, they go through this massive like process of recording every single detail of a real piano, every single key, every single note, every single articulation, everything the real thing can do, they record all of that and they put together this super complicated like puzzle of all these things and load it into a sampler and that sampler then intelligently plays back whatever is needed depending on the MIDI input and what you hear are real recordings of real instruments that mm -hmm. are being played back. So it's not the same as a synthesizer. It's not fake. It's not, there are better ones and not so good ones because like some people make record good stuff and others don't. And also like the way the sampling engine works is different. So there's a lot that goes into that. But at the end of the day, it's real recordings that you hear when when a sampler plays something. And what Malcolm just described with a DJ is the same thing. They use a small sampler. And when you hit that pad, a sample that they loaded into that sampler is being played. And yeah. uh, it's simple as that. And you can you, you do your own things as um, as Malcolm just described. And you can... You can get very creative here. I remember when I was at the URM Summit 2018, the year before you went there, like Joey Sturgis did um, a presentation there where he recorded sounds with a field recorder in the audience. Like um, people would like hit their chest or clap or like do weird noises with their throats and all sorts of stuff. And he recorded those noises with a field recorder, then put it like um, imported in, into the DAW, manipulated it with whatever he did there. And then he made kick drums and pad sounds and stuff like that out of the noises he just recorded in the, the audience. He loaded it right. into a sampler and then you could just trigger it and use it as drum samples or it played with a piano. And you can put it, there are things like sampler tracks in Cubase, for example, or other softwares do the same thing where you import one sound, one sample, 
And then it will automatically transpose if you like hit another key and you can play a melody with one single recorded sample, basically. And you so that's what he did there, right. which was very cool. Yeah, like he he did a complete like post production effects thing and the kick drum sample and stuff with things he just recorded in the audience five minutes ago. So, that's super cool. Yeah, exactly. So that that's you can do. That's what you can do, and that's the concept of sampling of recording something, cutting out the rele- relevant part of it. Loading it to a sampler and then triggering it with a MIDI note. Yeah. So MIDI note hits sampler. Sampler says, okay, I'll grab this audio file and then plays it. And you hear that audio file. Yep. Um, but I do like that you brought up the creative side of being able to manipulate that audio as well. Like you, So it, there's a trend going on for the last while, actually, multiple years maybe, in pop music where there's like these... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, sound more beautiful than that, but it's like a voice all like... <laughs> kind of like weird and it's not saying a word but it's normally like some kind of vocal sample that's being manipulated to hell and is being played on multiple notes kind of thing and like this uh, sampler engine is making it sound like that um, you know you pitch it up and and reverse it or whatever kind of thing um, so there there's all sorts of creative ways to use samplers as well um, I think we should maybe talk about how this ties into drum samples a little bit now yep. getting back to that because i got into sampling drums using an audio file not midi at least in my head that's what i thought i was doing um because slate trigger which is probably the most common sampler drum sampler i think you you could grab like the snare track or let's say kick track actually so you grab the kick track and you throw you load open a plugin on it and this is your audio kick track like a real kick open a plugin called slate trigger and it allows you to grab any drum sample you want. And when it detects the kick being hit, the live kick on that audio file being hit, it decides to play the sample that you've chosen. So it's kind of like what the process we just described. But instead of sending a MIDI data, um, it's detecting audio data and deciding to play. But I think behind the hood, it's detecting audio data and sending MIDI data to play that sampler. I think it's just like yes. using audio as a trigger for MIDI. <laughs> it's a real-time <laughs> audio to MIDI thing that happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, before you jump in and say that's a very bad way to use that plugin, which I agree, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that, that's, that's where the confusion could be that, that it's audio doing it. But it's just that audio is telling it to fire MIDI in this case. Um, but yeah, so the same could be... There's other tools that do the same thing where you could um, detect off the audio and generate MIDI uh, spikes essentially and then tell those midi spikes to play a certain sample as well um, and in that case you're placing them uh, essentially with drums though if you want to blend or sample replace you have to generate midi that hits at the same same exact same time as the audio of your drum track but corresponds with the sample you want to play so slate trigger is just a tool that lets you do that um, and and there's there's other ones as well. Like there might be one built into your DAW, for example. But the important bit is that it has to fire exactly when your drum does. Exactly, and yeah, that's the important bit. But you also have to sort of hope or assume that the person who made the samples cut them the right way, and that mm-hmm. there is because what it does is you you can you can load a TCI file, which is a trigger file that can read the different velocity layers and all that, or you can just load up a WAV file into Trigger and it will just play the WAV file. But for example, if you made a, a, a snare sample on your own and you left half a second of silence in the beginning of that sample, it will trigger at the right moment, but the snare sample will be late because of that yes. silence that's in the beginning. So you need to cut it very, very short and you got to sort of hope that it matches the original drum. You got to flip the phase and check if it works and stuff. Yeah. So, but that's that you have to assume that this is the the case and then you can use it in real time. I and it it works actually very well. What I want to say though is and I think you agree is that a better way to use trigger is to not just throw it on the audio track but to convert your drum tracks to MIDI so you have it on a MIDI track and then send that MIDI to trigger and set trigger to respond to the MIDI and not to the audio because what that mm-hmm. does is you won't have missed triggers. It will only trigger where the MIDI notes are. So that's that's one thing. You have complete control over fills, ghost notes, stuff like that. So you can manipulate the MIDI before it hits trigger. 
And yeah. um, so it will sound more organic probably. And also you have very reliable results because what Trigger does is when you use a sample library with multiple different samples per velocity layer, one might be in phase, another one might be slightly out of phase and you get like these random triggers and some hits will sound weird and like you play you play the track back and one time it will sound good and the next time it will be a little different so you don't get as consistent of a result. So yeah. I really like to use MIDI because it's more consistent and then I like to commit as fast as possible. I just wanted to say that because I've received a couple of tracks from people where they sent like the drums and then they sent on a separate track the trigger, like the sample track that they wanted me to use. And they printed whatever trigger did, but it's missed triggers and flams and yeah. out of phase stuff and everything all over the place. And to prevent that, I would always recommend, it's a little more tedious, but I would always recommend converting the actual audio into a MIDI track and then using that to trigger trigger or mm -hmm. another drum sampler or whatever. It also gives you the freedom to try different tools because you can shoot out trigger samples against contact instruments or a superior drummer or whatever. So yeah, totally. having that actual MIDI track um, is always sort of worth it for me. I don't yeah. like to rely on the audio triggering. I, I think this is one of the things that, this is one of the reasons we say hire a professional mixer because a professional mixer is going to spend, it, like it takes a lot of time to do this to a whole drum kit because we're literally checking every single hit to make sure that it's perfectly phase aligned with the exact start of that hits like sample. Um, mm -hmm to the sample. So doing that across the kick, across the snare, across ghost notes if you need to, across the toms, whatever needs to happen. And like if there's some rim shots and stuff, like we might need to trigger those to a different channel, right? Um, uh, it really depends on the song, but it's a time-consuming thing and it's not very easy to do actually either. People, I've seen people do it pretty wrong. Not like unsure what they're looking at, you know, um, when they're lining it up. So that is, yeah, that's one thing that that's why you pay mixers. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I Honestly. little tip here, yeah, you're totally right. And little tip here, if you want to con know the best tool to convert your drums to MIDI, uh, I've done quite a bit of testing, and I liked like the the built-in Cubase audio to MIDI thing, like hit, creating hit points and then converting that to MIDI or the equivalent in like Pro Tools works. But what works better than everything else I've tested is like the tracker in Superior Drummer. It's phenomenal. Mm. It's like okay. phenomenal. It's like a standalone thing. You need to import the drums to that, create the MIDI, and then re-import that into your DAW. But it's so worth it because that thing, I don't know what it does, but it does it so intelligently. You get all the... the you get, if you have a snare with a ton of bleed, and like the, the, the quietest ghost notes are way quieter than the hi-hats or the crashes, it still detects that ghost those ghost notes and ignores the the symbols so right. sort of so you get all the small details it does the fills correctly like thomas um who does all the, the the prepping and editing and drums to midi stuff for me he uses the tracker and he sort of sort of um showed it to me how, how powerful it is and we immediately switched from the cubase audio to midi to the tracker and uh it's just so much better like the first project he ever prepped or like edited for me and, and prepped for me was like something pretty organic with like a lot of fills and ghost notes and subtle stuff. And I doubted that we could even like do it properly, like that it would sound organic. And he just showed me the MIDI results. It obviously like a lot of manual work went into it as well. But it was like I loaded up some sample and it just blended perfectly and sounded so organic. So if you right. have that, if you have Superior Drummer, try the tracker. If you're looking cool. for a tool, um, that feature alone will in addition to the amazing sounding samples, of course, is worth Superior Drummer, I think. Interesting. Okay, that's good to know. I use Massey DRT. Oh, yeah, that's um, great too. Which which is definitely great, um, but I haven't tried Tracker, so I'm curious. But uh, I do it a little bit different than you. Okay. Um, I still generate audio files, but I generate really short, immediate audio blips that are a sample long, essentially. So that um, And then that allows me to use Trigger and throw sensitivity up to 100% okay. and, and detection to, to like as close as possible so that it just immediately fires. And it yeah, I, I printed it and it's exactly perfectly phase aligned. Yeah. Um, so same tool, different thing, just because Pro Tools really sucks with MIDI. Yeah. Um, 
So I avoid MIDI whenever I can. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. It's the yeah, it, it works just as well, I think. And by the way, Mass CDRT I think is way better at MIDI detection than Trigger is, for example. You can use Trigger as well for oh, that, yeah. but Mass yeah. CDRT is so much more accurate. So yeah, so I use Massey to generate my key spikes, and then I will send those key spikes into Trigger yeah. from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. That's the system I'm using. But yeah, uh, if you listen to this point, you've already learned the MIDI Basics 101. I think and, so. Because <laughs> this is not MIDI Basics 101 yeah. anymore. So let's, uh, let, yeah, let's circle back um, and then wrap it up. Like, so what are the typical use cases for MIDI? Just to sum it up. So we have obviously playing a piano or a piano like mm -hmm. instrument with a MIDI piano and then triggering a software instrument or paying, playing pads, strings, synths, anything like that. So, Right. Playing an actual instrument. What else? Uh, I mean, then, like we just said, re sample replacing or augmenting drum performances um, would be the the next for me. Um, but there is actually a third one that's fun. Um, I guess it's more of a mixing thing, but worth mentioning is gating um, or, yep. or I mean, just key spiking dynamics in, in general. Um, so what that means is that you could have something like a gate, which we're going to be talking about. Actually, we're going to do a little like introduction to different concepts but here's the the brief one of gating uh, a gate will just like in theory mute a signal until a certain threshold is hit and then it opens the gate and allows that signal through um, and it doesn't have to fully mute it but for simple terms that's what we're saying um, so you throw that on a snare track and until it gets hit by the blast of a snare which is going to be the loudest thing on that mic it is just muting that track to get rid of all the lead in between those snare hits kind of thing. Now, the problem is that snare hits aren't consistent because drummers aren't machines. Um, so it's hard to find that perfect threshold. Uh, and maybe they play a part really quiet so the gate doesn't get triggered there and the snare's just muted for that section, which is obviously bad. Um, or there's a crash near, or the hi-hat gets hit really loud and it triggers it as well or something. There's all, it could be anything. Like there's, it's really hard to gate accurately without manually just going in and automating it yourself um but key spikes do this for us so if we go back to what we were just talking about and we generate midi spikes for each snare hit using massy drt or superior drummer tracker or whatever uh you can then set that to be what triggers the gate to fire and you know that it's 100 percent aligned because you've manually gone and done it um and that gives you a lot of power oh yeah also you know it's aligned you know you won't have these miss um, is the, the, the gate opening on, on spots where it shouldn't open. And I think the most powerful thing about it is I used to cut cut out tom tracks for years. Like that, that's what I would always do. Like if there's too much bleed on the toms, I would go in, cut out all like all the bleed and just leave the actual hits in there. Yeah. I've completely, um, like for, from, from doing that, I completely went to just using MIDI gates on the toms. Not only because it's easy, because I usually already have them from MIDI anyways, um, because Thomas always preps that for me in case I need samples or anything. But I think the most powerful thing about it is with a normal gate, um, like manually it always works, of course, but it's tedious. But with a normal gate, not only will it sometimes open in the wrong spot, but if, even if it opens correctly and even if you have like the attack to the, this, this, the fastest possible setting you still get a weird click in the beginning sometimes, a weird sound because it's just not opening fast enough. Or it's like, yeah, it just changes the attack sound of, of the tom sometimes. Then when you use the look ahead function so that the gate opens a little earlier, that can mess with the phase or the timing of the drums and all that sort of stuff. But with a MIDI track that triggers the gate to open, I just move the whole MIDI track to the left a couple of milliseconds or like a very short amount of time so that the gate opens slightly before the actual tom hit and that way i get it to open super like in time without any artifacts the gate doesn't mm -hmm. affect the sound in any way and uh that's that trick alone is worth it to me so um i just i, I by placing the midi notes intentionally i can say when the gate should open and it's not always the exact it's not always exactly aligned with the toms. It's most of the time a little earlier so that I can avoid the look ahead and the very right. short attack times. So yeah, there's so much power in these in these things. And um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the triggering of gates. What else would be there as a use case? Drum programming, I mean, obviously. I mean, yeah, drum programming. Um, sometimes I'll use 
still on sampling actually, but I'll use it to trigger special effects like a bass drop or or claps. So I just like duplicate the snare trigger and now I've got claps firing instead kind of thing. So it's the same thing, but it's just in my head, it's like a different part of the mix. Yeah, um, yeah. And because uh, it's just like the sauce on top. <laughs> yeah. So stuff like that, you know, um, you could uh, program like, you know, sub lines or something like that. That's like something that just reinforce a course with like a sub bass, you know, just draw it in with a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, it's it's really limited to your creativity, I think. Oh yeah, I got I got two little things and then it, that's probably everything I can think of right now, but these cool. are actually very cool. So one more use case would be you could use a, cl- um, a MIDI track as a click track. So, or to like easily exchange like projects between two different DAWs or whatever instead of using the built-in click you can program a MIDI click and have that trigger an instrument so that could be a way you could use it but here comes a really cool thing you can and that's actually helpful if you transfer um, your files to a mixing engineer for example if you send your files off to mixing and you have like complicated tempo maps going on like tempo changes and the person receiving your files has to recreate those tempo maps, which can sometimes be pretty impossible if there's like smooth transitions and everything. What you can do is, even if there's no MIDI track in your project, you can just create an empty MIDI track, make one note in the very beginning, one at the very end, like make the MIDI track as long as your track is, but just two notes. I I always put like two notes in there because it just works. And then I export that useless, almost empty MIDI track along with all the audio tracks. And when the other person imports those into their DAW and they start with the MIDI track, usually that MIDI track has the tempo info in it. And usually your tempo track in your DAW will automatically set the tempo track to whatever is in the MIDI and then you can import the audio and it will be perfectly aligned with, like you will have the tempo map there. So that's a cool right. way to import a tempo map from another session. It's just create an empty MIDI track. It has the tempo info. Import that first and there you have your tempo track because that can be a pretty complicated thing to do sometimes to get the tempo from one session sure. to another. Yeah, I've, I've run into that problem and it's kind of a pain in the ass to work backwards to fix. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, um, I think that's pretty comprehensive for, for trying to wrap your heads around MIDI if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, but even if you were, I'm sure there was kind of some new concepts and ideas in there to consider using. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, those episodes I think could be fun. So we're going to do more like these basic concept episodes in the future, we're going to touch on some things that just matter and are um, important to know whether you're recording or mixing or whatever you're doing, but like knowing these basic things like MIDI, gating, as Malcolm said, compression, EQ, like just basic concepts that you can apply to whatever you're doing. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of those in the future. And um, I'm sort of looking forward to this because we really skipped this sort of up, up until now. Mm-hmm. We always talk about very specific things but yeah, time to address the basics and go yeah, more definitely. in depth on those concepts. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for listening. Um, see you next week. Definitely. I guess. See you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.